Hello everyone and welcome to the May 3rd Council meeting of the Village of Lytton. I'd like to take a moment to remind everyone to turn off their video, mute their microphones, and to allow Council to begin the proceedings. Just to let you know, you're all being recorded and broadcast on the Village of Lytton YouTube channel. If anyone is looking for a video recording of this meeting or past meeting, you can go there and watch it. Thank you, Mayor Potter. You may call the meeting to order. Great, thank you, um, CEO Bandman. So I call this meeting to order at 7.01. So this meeting is a special council meeting to replace last week's regular meeting. So welcome everyone. I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that I am here um, on the territory of the Tecumlis to Shwetmuk people, and I'm here with CEO Bandman this evening. So we'll move on to adopting of the agenda. So can I please council have a motion, uh, recommended motion to adopt the agenda for tonight's special meeting. Oh, you're muted, Councillor Lightfoot. So moved Lightfoot. Thank you, a seconder. We can. Any, any errors that anyone found? Nope, seeing none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I'm carried, thank you. So we'll move on to adopting the minutes of the special meeting that was held on April the 4th. Um, a, a motion, please, for that recommended. So move, Toss. Thank you, and a seconder? Second, Lightfoot. Thank you. Any errors or omissions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. And carried, thank you very much. So this evening we have a delegation. We have um, Patrick Michelle here to talk to us about the building symposium that's coming up. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Patrick. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council for this opportunity. Um, so on May 19th and 20th, uh, we're bringing together Canadian institutions, Canadian builder suppliers. We're putting them all in one place, Kamshin uh, School. And the event uh, will start at nine o'clock on the Friday. There's eight, four presentations on uh, Friday, four presentations on Saturday with two keynote speakers. I've drafted a presentation. Um, what do you call it? A, a mind blank all of a sudden. Okay. The posters. <laughs> so we, we have... Uh, we have an agenda that's at the highest level. I've got it with communications right now. We'll doctor it up. We would like to uh, replace the April 12th, save the date and the mayor's message from March. that we're talking about the rebuilding, building symposium with the future in mind. So it's going ahead. There's a lot of interest uh, in the, within the region. And, uh, you know, I, we, the best I can say is I'm not stressed out yet, but I've got my fingers crossed when I say that. It is a very exciting event, the interest that is coming in. And so what we wanted to do is shift from save the date now to invitation. One feedback that I kept getting from is that the the chiefs, the, the, uh, the, the, the First Nations communities, as well as the mayor and others, need to invite people. So me uh, email blasting everybody saying, come on in. Apparently, there's this protocol that the bear needs to invite uh, the prime minister and the premier and or delegate. So I'm hoping to be able to work with the mayor to get up something nice saying, here's the save it date, your staff have it. Here's the invitation, uh, prime minister Trudeau. If you can't make it, we'll be happy to accept a delegation. We don't know who's going to come, but we do know that uh, the village of Lytton will be there. The first nations will be there. The TNRD will be there. They've confirmed that. We know that uh, staff are coming in from the federal and provincial governments to set up tables and to do presentations. I'm really looking forward, for example, to the very first presentation, uh, which I've called Why the Building Symposium, and it goes dot to climate change. So I've asked uh, the Minister of Environment, we'll send a, a staff member over as well as have presentations from the federal and provincial government talking about is climate change real? 
You don't have to ask anybody from the Lytton and the Fraser Cannon region. We've lived it. All the presentations and the keynote speakers will be recorded. And uh, once a little bit of editing occurs, well, I'd like to live stream it much. Like, it's not live stream, but to be able to take advantage of the, the Village of Lytton's YouTube channel so that people don't have to be there, there for the full time. They can catch up. Um, I think one of the most uh, heavily, uh, one of the most... The heaviest attendance session will probably be keynote session number one, which is a call Lytton and the Fraser Canyon region as at one o'clock on May 19th. What is the current state of the recovery and rebuilt? So uh, for the village of Lytton, uh, Michael Blaschuk will be the lead on that one. And I'm sure that uh, when we spoke with Ella Fenner, I spoke with Ella Fenner, will either be Chief Hanna or Councillor Robertson will speak on behalf of Lytton First Nations. So I want to thank everybody for this incredible opportunity to be your event coordinator and for the committee that has been providing questions, comments, concerns, uh, and in particular, English editing. Thank you, Councillor McCann. It's not like you were my teacher in elementary school. but <laughs> <laughs> So what we have here now is starting tomorrow, I'd like to be able to see it go on to Litton.ca's website. It will be a truncated event saying 8 to 5 Friday, or sort of, yeah, eight to five Friday, nine to four on Saturday, speakers. I will end this saying that at this moment, I have 17 confirmed tables with over 30 waiting to dot that I and cross the T. But once people realize that, yes, it's the May Day long weekend, but that's when the people from Lytton and our area are going to be here, not the weekend before, not the weekend after. If you want to meet the people from Lytton and the region who are impacted, come here on the May Day long weekend. One of the weekends where we've always come together. And at this time, we're asking that the people who care and in the nicest possible way, the people who have resources can meet with us. And so I, I don't do a lot of work on Facebook. So I'm hoping that uh, as we shift to invitation and Facebook, that really takes off now and gets uh, people aware of the event. So thank you very much again for uh, allowing me to share this evening. Thank you, Patrick. Um, yeah, so I look forward to that list of uh, who is going to be there and the keynote speakers. So that, uh, as you said, that should be coming out very soon. Council, are there any questions or comments for, for Patrick this evening? Uh, Councillor McCann? Well, Patrick forgot to mention that there will be food trucks, which is probably just as important as anything else that's on this event. Yes, thank you, Councillor McCann. I have requested their menus uh, because their 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 names of their companies can be a little deceiving. Golden Bannock, I think they're doing tajitos. No, they're not. They're doing Bannock. The fuzzy pickle was trickier. There, he's actually a sandwich truck. I'm just saying. So his name is misleading. So we have two food trucks that'll come up, and then uh, they'll also provide services to the media event uh, as well. But they will be parked at Kamshin close to the the the. the the, the football field. Great, good. Any other questions or comments for Patrick? Being, uh, Councillor Toss? Well, I was just gonna say thank you. I was checking if my mute was on. Okay, <laughs> great, good. And Councillor Lightfoot? I just wanna thank uh, Councillors McCann and Thoss and, and Patrick for um, pulling this together. And I think it's, uh, a great opportunity and I look forward to seeing as many people as possible come out that, that weekend. Yeah, ditto, yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks again, Patrick. Now we're on to public comment and I'm going to turn it over to CO Bannock. Thank you very much, Mayor Connor. Members of the public are now invited to comment on matters related to the agenda. If you'd like to speak, speak please use your raise hand function on Zoom. You can find that by clicking on reactions at the bottom of your screen and then clicking raise hand. When it's your turn, your name will be read and we'll ask you to unmute yourself. You will get a pop-up on your screen and ask you to unmute. You have two minutes to speak uh, per speaker. We ask the speakers state their name, address, and agenda item number they're speaking for each comment. If you'd like to speak, please do so.
Marina, are there any uh, uh, raised hands at this time? There are no raised hands at this time. So we invite the members of the public one more time, if you'd like to speak, please use the raise hand function so that we can see, so that we can get you to speak at this meeting. Thank you. Going one more time. Marina, any raised hands? No, no raised hands. No raised hands, okay. Thank you very much, Mayor Hunter. All right, thank you. So we'll move on to item number seven, uh, staff reports and presentations. And I'm um, going to turn it over to our CFO, Diane Mombercat. Thank you, Mayor O'Connor. Good evening, uh, Mayor O'Connor and members of council. Uh, I'd like to start this evening by acknowledging that I'm in, coming to you from Mi'kmaq, uh, the ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people. So I'm here tonight to do a presentation on the property tax rates for 2023. So we're doing this, I'm doing this presentation tonight uh, for your information. I felt it was important to um, run through uh, where we've landed in, in light of the fact that the five-year financial plan is later in the agenda for first three readings of that bylaw. So I wanted you to have some, some context of what it means in terms of the property tax rates. So we're gonna run through a few slides to, um, to take you through some of that stuff. So can you see my screen? Yes. Good, yeah. thank you. Um, so the property tax rates, the municipal property tax rate is really made up of two components. And so we have the property tax rate or what's sometimes referred to as a mill rate and we have the assessed value that gets determined by BC assessment for each property in the village. So initially uh, BC assessment produces a preliminary role at the end of December, then um, property owners have the opportunity to appeal their assessments and, and seek adjustments to the values. And BC assessment produces a, a final role kind of late March, early April. They did let me know that this year there were uh, six appeals filed on um, properties in Lytton, but uh, all of the original values were confirmed. So we have the same assessment values at the end as what we had at the beginning. And we've been looking at these numbers, you know, sort of over the last couple of months. So just to re remind everyone that at the regular council, council meeting on April 12th, council had directed staff to prepare our financial plan based on a 6% increase in property tax revenue. So that increase um, results in additional revenue of $18,336 uh, for total municipal taxes of $323,928. So in addition to the municipal taxes, uh, the Village of Lytton collects taxes on behalf of some other organizations as well. And so we collect taxes for the, the TNRD, the, uh, the regional hospital, the school district, police, and then a very small amount for BC Assessment Authority and the Municipal Finance Authority. Those, are, those, those organizations are funded by all municipalities in the province. And so in 2023, the taxes that we'll be collecting on behalf of others is 90,345. So about 20, you know, if you look at our total taxes that we'll be collecting, 25% of it is on behalf of other, of other organizations. When we um, calculate the amounts for these, um, these other organizations, some of them give us a specific rate to use to apply against the assessed value, and other, um, others give us a, a total dollar number to collect. So in that case, we take the total dollar number and we spread it across the different classes of, of properties in the same proportion as how the municipal taxes are, uh, are raised. So just in a, a summary of where we kind of ended up in for 2023, our total assessed value for these are the four classes that we currently have in Lytton. So class one is residential, class two is utilities, class four is major industry and class six is commercial. So our total assessed value of those four classes, I forgot to actually put the total on here, it's, it's 18,490,000. So 
for each of those values, then we apply the, the, the rates that are that you see on the screen there. So the municipal tax rate for residential properties will be 5.2315. So this number is per $1,000 of assessment. In addition to that, we're gonna collect 0.7957 on behalf of others. And that will mean our total taxes that we collect will be 60,762 from the residential property owners. For the utilities, the utilities is a little bit different because the school taxes are collected on a different assessment value. So if you tried to do the math on this line, it's not gonna work because there's a different calculation that comes into it. It comes into play here. It's, it's just the way that the, the utilities are taxed. So the municipal tax rate on utilities is um, $40 and it is capped in all municipalities at either the, the, the greater number of 40 or two times the commercial rate. So in our case, the greater number is 40. So that's the, the municipal rate for the, on the utilities and then the taxes collected on behalf of others is 18.6938 for a total of 251. The major industry, um, our municipal tax rate is, is 106.9714. Um, you see the rate there for the uh, collected on behalf of others for a total uh, tax burden for that group of 59,951. And then the commercial is the final group with the uh, municipal tax rate of 10.8358 and collected on behalf of others of 1.6656. So when you look at these rates, they kind of look like they're all over the place and they change year to year based on how much the assessment value has changed as well. So in some cases, the rate itself might go down because the assessment value has gone up so much. So we, we have to kind of work with, uh, within all those different um, factors in coming up with the rates. The end goal being that the total taxes collected on behalf of the village is 6% greater than it was last year. So just by comparison, this is the, these are the 2022 numbers. So you can see in the case of the residential, the municipal tax rate last year was 6.486. This year it's 5.2315. So it looks like it's gone down, but because the assessments have gone from 7.8 million to 10 million, if we didn't adjust the rate down, people's taxes in dollars would be going through the roof because their assessed values have, have increased. So like I said, there's a little bit of work kind of back and forth to make sure that we, um, you know, that we set the rate at the right amount in order to have a reasonable increase for residents, a responsible increase, because as we know, the costs of running the village are all increasing. And, um, you know, it's important that we continue to provide a financially sustainable uh, model for the village. Um, so when the property tax bylaw is on the agenda next week on May the 10th, these will be the tax rates that will be um, proposed in that bylaw. And these are the tax rates that were used to generate the five-year financial plan. Okay. And so that's it. <laughs> Well, thank you, Diane, uh, CFO of <laughs> um, You're welcome. Oh, very well presented and very clear to understand. I really appreciate that. Are there any um, questions or comments from council? No. Okay, so that just shows how clearly you explained <laughs> that. Thank you very much. You're, you're welcome. Thank you. Okay. A resolution on the table here. So yes, yeah, so we do have a yeah. Thank you. We do have a resolution here. So um, council, who would like to make the motion that council receive the property tax rate report for information? I move. I move that council receives the property tax rates report for information. Thank you. A seconder. I'll second that motion. Thank you, Councillor McCann. All those in favor? Aye. And Aye. Carried. Aye. Thank you. Okay, 7.2, we're going to move on to recovery managers. And we have, uh, yeah, a verbal update. So I think we're going to turn, I'm going to turn it over to Mike Blaschak. There you go. 
Okay, thank you, Mayor. I'll give you a, a quick update. Both um, myself and uh, my partner on this, Don Wong, have been uh, quite active both in town and working on a number of files. A big part of the initial stage has been listening uh, to people, listening to concerns and listening to ideas. Um, we've been connecting with many people, both uh, in Lytton and uh, with the uh, provincial government and local municipalities and uh, local First Nations. Uh, we've been attending meetings uh, the public meetings have been going on to sort of help tap into the, the pulse and get a sense um, of, of uh, people's feelings about the project. Um, so far, no one has told us it's gone too fast. I can tell you that. Um, the uh, We're also working on uh, a number one priority is, is meeting our sort of financial ob obligations for reporting and, and uh, ensuring that we get release of the second phase of funding ASAP. Um, our, our meetings with EMCR have been very positive on that. Um, the requirements on updating our governance status of the project and the plan going forward, uh, are, we're very active on. We've been uh, working with council uh, on uh, setting up the, the the updates on the plan going forward, and we anticipate we'll have that uh, ready in time and ready to present. Um, we're preparing to sort of switch from phases on the project, from um, much of the cleanup and initial sort of mass archaeological work. Um, remediation is sort of at this stage uh, is starting to wrap up, and you'll see that starting to to get ready as we sort of wind down some of the works there. And we're going to really start switching heavily to you know to getting the water, the sewer, utilities, the road works, and getting that fired up and get. Uh, quite aggressive on timelines of getting that ready. Um, we're in meetings with some local municipalities about some resources that we believe are there, both in terms of equipment um, and personnel and expertise that will be able to help us. And uh, I can report that those meetings and negotiations are going very well. Um, we're also active on setting up a recovery office, uh, location I expect to be announced shortly. Um, it will be very public office. You'll be able to come in, you'll be able to talk to us there. All our activities you will see posted on the walls. We work from a, 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 a whiteboard type project management style. You'll be able to see all the subjects there, who's doing what, what due dates, uh, what initiatives are starting, which ones are ending, where the finances are flowing and when they're flowing. All of that will be on the walls. You'll be able to come in um, to the uh, to the office and see that. We welcome people to come in and we're more than glad to walk people around and, and show what the status of the project is, where we're, where we're finding successes and where we're finding challenges. Um, we're uh, in, in discussions with a lot of government partners who've come forward and really want to help, who will start, we'll start adding them to the governance structure as advisory roles. Um, and also look at whether the resources they can bring. Um, many are stepping forward to provide us with everything from free fill to technical advice to equipment to, um, uh, uh, and, and, and we feel that will sort of help us both manage the costs of the project and, uh, and bring in some really high level expertise to, um, to keep proceeding in, in a, what will be a very aggressive time frame. So uh, you will have seen uh, myself on the site. You will see me driving around. You'll see me asking some tough questions of people and and uh, finding out why things aren't moving as fast as they could be. But we will get them moving fast. And I'm and I'm proud to present uh, that that um, we're happy with the progress we're making to date. Thank you, Mike. Um... You've provided us with a lot of optimism there and um, such positive, positive information. So much, much appreciated. Uh, Council, are there any comments or questions you might have for, for Mike or Don? Mm, seeing nothing. Thanks again for that update. All right, um, we'll move on to item number 7.3, Director of Development. We have, I've forgotten how to say your name, Bertie. Uh, <laughs> Hello, good I evening. I apologize. <laughs> I'll no let you worries. We'll get it. <laughs> good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, you've got Birte, Declu, and Corey here tonight. Uh, Ron sends his regrets. He was unable to attend tonight and um, what uh, we, of course, have a PowerPoint. You'll notice we tend to like to put those together just to give some framework to what we're talking about. But what we're asking tonight is asking for endorsement of the policy and regulation framework. 
If you're good with it, we'll start the PowerPoint now. Okay, um, I'm assuming everyone can see it. So well, the screen tells me that you can see it. So I'm gonna trust that the screen is telling me the truth here tonight. Um, so we're back, we're happy to be back again. And we believe um, we're at our next steps again. So on the last meeting, when we came and spoke to you, um, we were talking about going from a gray matter and falling blocks to some round, some heavy edges to starting to round out the edges and talk about the participate the participants in a planning process and focus on how the provincial government, the regional and local governments work together to manage planning and development. Tonight, we wanna to talk very much more specific about the local government that is Lytton and what are the planning, what is in our planning toolbox? Um, we wanna make sure of course that we provide you with the right tools for the job and we believe that understanding the, the five W's will provide the information on how. Um, we'll endeavor as always to provide really clear and simple communication, but um, some of this is can be complicated. So please, as always, answer or ask us any questions that you might have along the way. Okay, so to provide the context for the things that we'll be looking at in our next steps, um, we've created this policy and regulation framework. What it does is help to demonstrate how you move from the vision that's contained within an official community plan down through what is important, what you're hoping to achieve, what action is gonna be taken to, to achieve it and how that action uh, more specifically um, in terms of strategy. And then we get right down to the detailed instructions for completing specific tasks. That's of course, the focus of what we'll be talking to you about next week when we present the bylaw. So um, we did not hear any feedback. So we have proceeded to take our best guess, if you will, um, uh, with respect to that. But we really wanted to squeeze this in between so that we're creating that really solid foundation. In accordance with the direction provided in the Local Government Act, Part 14, and there's divisions and sections, et cetera. An OCP is intended to be a policy document. So that's why it's at the top of this. The OCP is the long-term vision and the consolidation of council's policies and objectives for land use, community well-being, and form and character development. Legally speaking, the official community plan enshrines principles that are above the daily politics of rezoning, variance, and uh, development approvals. They're meant to govern the overall direction of development at, and its pace at a policy level without descending into the day-to-day -day workings. Am I next? Yeah. So the zoning bylaw is that day-to-day -day workings. I always like to talk about the zoning bylaw as the rules on the ground. You know, the house needs to be this many meters from the property line. Um, there's many different rules and right, regulations. And as we've noted here on the slide, the people that need to follow it are obviously the property owners and the occupants when we're building something. What it is, it talks about the use, the siting, general rules um, in terms of land use regulations, etc. And when does it come to play whenever a new development or activity comes forward? How do we or where do we see where these rules are? Obviously, they're in the zoning bylaw, but there's also the zoning map that informs us on what each individual property has as a zone, and that guides us to the zoning bylaw. So why do we have a zoning bylaw? Because it takes, it, it, it works, I'm going to say, to implement the OCP policies and make sure that development that happens is in line with the OCP policies. Sorry. Um, how does that happen? This is where kind of crucial what's going to happen next is obviously the development approval procedure bylaw. And following into that is then the building bylaw. So again, um, our ident we identified the immediate needs and the immediate needs the City of Lytton has an OCP, the City of Lytton has a zoning bylaw, the, City of, uh, or the Village of Lytton also has building bylaws. However, what we don't have is a development approval procedure bylaw and the terms of reference for professional reports and studies. 
So developing a strong and healthy community, as you know, depends on the contribution and engagement of its people. From participating in the formulation of the community vision through creation of a strong community plan to providing input and feedback in order to preserve that vision through the various stages of the community's growth and evolution, citizens play a pivotal role in shaping the community for future generations. However, first things first, Let's get the process moving with the fundamental pieces, especially the procedures and supporting materials. So there's a standard process, essentially. There are legislative requirements, community needs, local government best practices, and all of these are brought together, hopefully, to create clear and simple uh, communication of information. For ease of administration, Procedure should be contained in a separate document from the official community plan or the land use regulations. As such, amendments to the official community plan may be required to avoid confusion, become consistent with the policy and regulation framework, and to maintain the consistency principle. You know that we have suspended DPs, for example, that's something that we will address in the development approval procedures bylaw, and we'll circle back to when we've had a chance to talk about that policy more. In the interest of improving processing efficiency, staff recommend that the new procedures bylaw take advantage of some of the recent changes to the Local Government Act that allow additional application decisions to be delegated to staff. So we need to define those and that's what the bylaw will help us do. So our next steps are to draft the development procedures bylaw, construct the terms of reference for professional reports and technical staff, create application forms and guidance documents, including contaminant site disclosure, um, and work on developing a board of variance bylaw and fact sheet explaining what the regulatory uh, framework are for having those. As you may have looked ahead, um, May 10th, which is next week, We'll be looking at the first two of these items on here, and the third one will be coming at a future date. That essentially concludes our comments tonight. And as usual, we're open for any questions. Thank you. Council, do you have any comments or questions? Councillor Lightfoot? No, no, I was just oh. putting my screen back on. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> I did. Councilor Councillor McCann. Yeah, um, this refers very much to the official community plan. It, it almost feels like we're going backwards, but I pretend, I'll pretend i pretend I don't think that. But if, if the village wants to adapt, change, or, or recreate their official community plan, these things can still kind of blend together nicely like the cogs on the wheel in your picture, right? Like it's not going to upset the apple cart by doing one before the other sort of thing, or is kind of a initiating a process? Sure. Okay. Um, yes, absolutely. We just, this is another way of looking at how those wheels flow together. It shows, shows the content, if you will, of those wheels. The wheel that's the OCP has that vision and those policies and objectives and it fits together with the land use regulation and the zoning bylaw, and that fits together with the development approval procedures bylaw. So we just really like to try to keep it clear um, how the wheels are fitting together and, and sort of this is a deep dive, if you will, into each of the wheels or the content of the wheels. We absolutely understand we're working with the existing bylaws, and as I mentioned, the development uh, permits and temporary use permits will be revisiting those, but we're going to get the process laid out so that, you know, the nuts and bolts are taken care of, and then we can step back and look at the bigger vision, but we really just want to get those wheels turning uh, at this point. And then I'm just going to add something. Most municipalities that haven't gone through the tragedy that you've gone through have all these uh, pieces in place. So again, I always bring it back to Kelowna because I'm sorry, that's where we're located. But Kelowna has a procedures bylaw, they have a zoning bylaw, and they, in, in the last few years, they just recently put an OC, a new OCP in, they did that several years ago. 
when they did it 10 years ago, they actually, and I'm sorry, I have speaker, Corey. <laughs> yeah, <so good. laughs> when they did it 10 years ago, they didn't change the zoning bylaw at all. In fact, the only thing that happened was the procedures bylaw got tweaked to, to reflect what that OCP is. Kelowna did something very big this year uh, in 2022, that is they changed the OCP, they changed their zoning bylaw completely, which had been around for 20 years, and they changed some of the procedures. So mostly all those changes come out of the OCP. So if there's something in the future that the OCP is going to change, then the bylaws could be reflected accordingly. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that. Um, I had a similar thought around that, around how it affects updating the OCP. So thank you for clearing that up. Um, any other councillors have any questions? Councillor Toss. Thank you, Mayor O'Connor. I'm wondering a bit more about the contaminated site disclosure statement. That is necessary because it's in our bylaw or is that like a provincially mandated requirement? That is correct. It's a provincially mandated requirement. Um, we have written the bylaw carefully so that um, there are a couple of different ways that we can meet that provincial requirement because we think that at the end of the day, they're likely going to produce something that's going to replace the need for individual property owners, particularly within um, certain areas, um, needing to fill out a form and we may well work with the province. So we've, we've left some wiggle room there, but absolutely it's a provincial requirement. It's a fairly straightforward process. It is simply something that will come with um, development applications. Um, somebody will fill out a, a single piece of paper essentially and submit it with their development application. It should be fairly straightforward. We have designed the procedure for how functionally we, as your consultants, are going to process those and get them to where they need to go. So we've defined that, recognizing that that was a considerable concern for you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Lightfoot. I'm not sure this is uh, appropriate or if it's within your venue, but what about, oh, we just talked about contaminated soils. What about archeological or heritage sites? How does that work into a bylaw? Or does it? So again, archaeology. Oh my goodness, archaeology. Okay, just archaeological. Oh, archaeological <laughs> branch um, also has mandated that all sites that are redeveloped now need to also have an assessment. Not an assessment. Have to have an archaeology review, mostly from a person that's making the application, i.e., making the application to Lytton. They just contact the branch, the branch says whether it's it's high, low or medium, whether there's any concerns and that comes back in with the application. What we're anticipating in, in this situation in the areas of Lytton that have burnt and have had archeology, span archeological work done, we're expecting get, to get those documents and already have that information without the people uh, being impacted more that they need to do that as well. So is your understanding that that information would come through the homeowner to the building um, department or directly to the building department upon request? So that really depends. If it's a, it's a home that's being rebuilt in the area that was burnt, um, we're hoping that that's already been assessed with the archaeology work that's being done. So therefore, um, the building department already has that information. If it were a home in another area that has not had that work done, it is a pretty simple uh, way to do it, and it is done mostly by the applicant. And it, again, that, that is a requirement from the provincial level. So it's more a case of us understanding how best to um, accommodate the community's needs while meeting the provincial requirement. So I we guess have some a little to move on. Used because I know some of our homeowners have registered to get that information. Um, yes. Because of and they may well, called, yeah, yeah, they may well have to submit that to us, but we're we'll, we're going to try to work with the province to alleviate that step if it's possible. It may not be, yeah, okay. and and we'll report obviously back to you if we are able to do it and and create that a, a greater sense of ease for the people that are um, having to rebuild. 
Great, thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. And uh, as you said, so next week, the, by, the actual bylaw for this uh, procedures will be, will be coming forward. Yeah, great. Okay, thank you. Oh, there is a resolution. Oh, we have a resolution, you're right, thank you. So um, who would like to make the motion? The recommended motion here, uh, Councillor McCann. So I would like to move that council endorses the policy and regulation framework contained in the report of the Director of Development dated May 3rd, 2023. And a seconder. Councillor Toss, is that? Yeah. And all those in favor. Mm -hmm. Carried. Thank you. All right. Uh, item 7.4, Economic Development Officer Colin O'Leary is here again this evening. Hello, Your Worship and Council. It's my pleasure to uh, get an opportunity finally to present this um, economic recovery plan, which I'm very excited to share with everyone. And so I will share my screen right now. Um, and you should see the report. So everybody see that? No, not yet. Not yet. Interesting. Okay, let me, um, give me a second. Of course, it worked perfect when we were trying to do it before. There. No, there we go. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. yeah, the trial run is, uh, yeah, without a hiccup. It's the real life one that'll always give you a hard time, right? So I will, uh, I just like to start off by saying that this is a very high level overview of the economic recovery report. Um, and so I'm just gonna cover some, very much some highlights. The actual report itself, I think is part of the package. It's over hundred pages long. Um, and so I'm going to go through it very quickly because it's very hard to cover all this information. And the other thing I'd like to say as well is that uh, two things right off the hop. One of them is um, some of these initiatives are actually uh, already started, it sounds like, to a degree. So some of the things uh, when we were building the report, they might not have necessarily been happening, but it sounds like they're almost starting to happen now, which is great to see that. I love it. And the other thing to also comment on is that a lot of these recovery uh, recommendations are based on the needs of the business community when we talk to them directly. And it might not be appropriate for the village itself to deliver on all of them, but it's important for us to capture all these. And a really good example of that is that by quantifying this information, we've seen this with other reports and identifying the needs of the business community, what we find is that sometimes there's other organizations, for example, maybe Community Futures or Pacific Can or United Way that actually might be better suited to, to actually deliver on, uh, on those needs. And so when they see this, we need to document this sort of stuff because then they can possibly access some of their own funding or different pots of money and be able to come in and actually deliver programming. And they need the data to be able to back that up. So that's some things to look at. So for example, when you see stuff, uh, we'll get into it where uh, we get into maybe like financing. Village Lytton, it makes no sense at all for the Village of Lytton to provide financing for the business community. But again, CF, Community Futures, um, it might be perfectly positioned to do something along those lines. So it gives you some examples. And it's a way of us actually being able to leverage some uh, outside organizations to deliver on some of these and for us to actually get out there the real needs of the uh, business community. So with that, I'll get right into it. Um, I already did a uh, validation presentation a little while ago now that kind of covered some of the key findings. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but uh, a quick refresher, you might remember, we did actually try to quantify actually and capture some of the uh, direct economic loss due to the wildfires in 2021. Um, lack of clear communication was something that was very uh, consistent. Uh, insurance shortfalls, most people plan on rebuilding. That was some of the good news. Uh, economic recovery support programs are very much needed. Uh, especially financial support for businesses. And in order for economic recovery to happen, we need people to move to the region, back into the region as soon as possible. We're going to get into this a little bit more, but it intrinsically links some of the housing to economic recovery, which is a connection we want to make. So recommendations, short-term recovery actions. We try to break them down into short, medium, and long-term. Uh, so we got an outline of what this looks like. The biggest thing we heard very loud and clear, if you look at things from an economic recovery standpoint, is that um, businesses need financial support. 
That is the loudest theme that we heard over and over again. This can manifest in a number of different ways. We heard things such as offering grants or low interest loans, grant funding to support escalating rebuild costs, startup grants and loans. We actually had a large uh, percentage of people that were interested in starting new businesses that, that didn't exist before, which is really exciting. Uh, can emergency business account uh, or SIBO loan forgiveness came up quite frequently. Uh, hiring grants, tax relief programs, and debt relief programs. These are things now we've heard some of this before. And so we now have quantified data so we can take people like, for example, MP Brad Viz, who I know I think was working on the SIBO loan forgiveness. He'll be able to go back actually and now use data and hard numbers to be able to back that sort of uh, those sort of efforts up. So hopefully this will arm him the information to be able to get more uh more headway on that front, or maybe other outside organizations will see this and see opportunities to be able to come in and provide the support. We suggested right off the top, and we've done this before, we have experience, uh, for example, accounts, we set up the, um, what was called YKA Strong. It's now actually a standing committee with the city. Um, it's called the business, um, the business, uh, oh, round table, I think is what they call it. They just rebranded it. But if you've ever been in Canada, so you see the stickers on the walls that are, that say YKA Strong. This is the kind of idea is really establishing a recovery roundtable working group. I know we have a lot of groups already that are out there that are trying to do recovery. What this is and the way this is different is you're going to take a, the lead person from each of these different initiatives that are happening. They have a table where they can sit down and they can talk to each other. Because the point of the matter is, is that almost every time you have economic uh, or you have any kind of a disaster, all these organizations are actually and they want to help. And we have all these different groups that are trying to do stuff and trying to help, but they're uncoordinated. And so if you have this simple little table where everybody sits around and they give everybody updates, what can happen is you can start to find out that, you know, this person wants to do this and this person wants to do the exact same thing, but actually this organization is better suited to really do this. And by having that quick little touch base, you're going to avoid duplication of efforts. Not only that, you're going to be like, oh, do you know what? Actually, you know, this tourism association is the best uh, association to do whatever. So instead of us trying to do it, they're going to do it, and we're going to get all of our contacts to go through them to do that effort. And so it's really amazing how simple this can be and how huge of an impact this, this can actually make. Because I think that a lot of people feel like there's a lot of duplication of things that are happening and things happening in silos. So there's a very simple uh, recommendation that can be implemented pretty much right away. We also uh, said that there really should be a coordinated preliminary rebuild plan, which includes both houses and businesses. We cannot link, we cannot disassociate housing from economics. And I know uh, my focus is on economic recovery, but as we've said before, uh, we businesses will not survive without people. So if we bring the people back with housing and there's no businesses, they might not actually want to come back or they might not stick around if they can't buy anything locally or what have you. If we go out, we rush out, we open up all these businesses, we have no people around, we have no labor and we have no customers to support the business, they'll run out of deficit for a while before they implode. And so what has to happen is there has to be a preliminary real world plan that has a coordinated effort so that it's time. So we are bringing back people at the same time as we are bringing up back businesses. That is going to give you your best chance possible for those businesses to economically recover. So that has to be a coordinated effort. And so you have to look at both of those factors when you look at this. And this is just talking about a, a preliminary rebuild plan. And we actually get into this, we actually identify uh, priority businesses to come back based on rank by priority uh, by applicants. So you can actually see, you don't have to rebuild the whole town right away, but there are certain things that people are looking for right away. So we try to build that plan for you. And then you can start to kind of take that and actually implement it. Um, Work with local government officials, MLAs, uh, the TNRD Council, and Interior Health, and really try to prioritize the construction of an urgent primary care facility in Linden. And if it's not a UPCC, then some sort of, and this has already kind of come up to some degree, some sort of a permanent primary care facility. When we looked at the economic data, before we started this project, we pulled your economic profile and all your economic data. And my immediate thing that I said is, I, was, I said, wow, like, is there a hospital there? Because did you know the amount of employment that came out of that and high paying jobs, and not only that, government jobs like this are recession proof, they're really stable. And so when you look at economic development without getting too much into the, like the science and the theory behind it, you have two businesses that are called basic and non-basic. And what happens is basic industries will bring money from outside of the community into the economy. 
Once that money is there, you get what's called uh, non-basic businesses that will circulate it around. A really good example of that is this, a healthcare facility, or if you look at logging or you look at tourism, they bring money from the outside in. And then what happens is they create employment and now those people want stuff like they want grocery stores and they want pharmacies. Those are the non-basic businesses. They will circulate that money around in your economy. That's what builds your economy. So this is something, there is a movement right now in the province and you could possibly capitalize on this to get some employment happening right away. And it's also very much a high priority for citizens and people that we talk to. Increased collaboration. And so the idea of this is, is kind of a broader sort of thing. And I want to really hone down on the idea of developing partnerships and working groups. So beyond that, there is definitely some frustration about like, and I've already uh, alluded to this, uh, lack of collaboration and communication between different groups and groups working in silos. And one of the things that we'd actually specifically like to mention, because we heard this from all, almost everybody that we interviewed, is that uh, there was a feeling that there should be more collaboration and actually working relationships with uh, LFN going forward. And everybody talked really positively about this. And it was kind of a funny thing because, you know, it, I don't think that there's a, there's a very thin wall stopping that. And I think you guys can make it happen almost immediately. And I remember Councillor McCann actually walking me over into the LFN uh, building and everybody loved you and Mara Connor and it was so friendly it was great and it was so easy for me to do a delegation there and so let's do more of that let's work together and because we are all one economy there is no separation there and so one of the things I would actually recommend is that the village set up a framework to have leadership meetings with both parties on a regular basis you should have a little touch base of like mayor and council and chief and council and I know there's election coming up but it's it's a small thing that I think could really help and there's no point in duplicating things that are happening. You know, tag team it, divide and conquer are like, you know, sorry, more hands lighten the load is a better analogy, I should say there. The, further to that, something else I'd actually recommend that, and I, I'd say this on a couple of different levels, and I think this is kind of a neat opportunity, but um, I would suggest actually, and this was a, this is a suggestion that came out of some LFN participants in the survey, is to actually have the ground blast by elders before construction begins doesn't cost any money. And the idea of this is multifold. First of all, you're going to start to, you know, start on a path forward from this point on, you're going to work together. But not only that, we really do. I know that the archaeology has been a, a kind of a point, uh, kind of a pain point because it's, it's been tough. But I think it's fair to actually recognize that there, I mean, the reality of it is that there is an archaeological site there. And there, these are burial grounds, and we need to be respectful. And we could use this as a pivotal point to change the relationship with LFN and with everyone in this path forward. But not only that, you all have a shared trauma. And, you know, this is an opportunity for us to come together and actually heal together. And I think everybody should be a part of that ceremony. Bring people in, start to mark like this is an opportunity for us to have that shared collective trauma and to start the path of healing together and set the stage for a collaborative relationship. It doesn't cost any money to do this. I think it would be a really amazing thing. And from what I've experienced is that there's a huge push right now. People are very interested in learning about indigenous culture. And I think people are, are really interested in this and open to this. And so that would be another suggestion, very easy. Establish a community mental health and wellness working group. I won't get into this too much, but the point of the matter is, is that there has been huge trauma here. And uh, with businesses, when you look at economics, some people will say, well, like, why is mental health coming to economics? I've already talked about this, but business owners are the most important asset to a business. Uh, and most businesses in this economy, 98% of them are small, medium-sized enterprises, 10 or fewer employees. Half of those are owner operators, so single employees. And uh, that's, how, that's what our economy is. And if you have mental trauma as a business owner, you are not operating your best uh, possible uh, platform. So we need to be real about mental health recovery and support. I love to see United Way is already stepping in and starting to do some of this. This is a really good example of where like certain organization, organizations are really well set up to deliver on some of this stuff. Develop a housing action plan that includes temporary and permanent housing options that serves immediate and long-term needs. So uh, we touched on this earlier, but a business owners made it very clear they can't rebuild up, they cannot rebuild their businesses if they're not able to rebuild their homes or move back there. I know that there was a there's already been an application for the rapid housing grant, which is amazing. 
<clears throat> temporary housing goes beyond just like the immediate need of housing people. It can support construction workers and contractors in the rebuild process. Not only that, actually, if you look at Merit, and I've been trying to track down Sean, uh, who's a friend of mine, the CAO there, they are actually offering their uh, rapid housing at a discounted rate to, uh, to people. They're not allowed to actually grant their citizens, but they are actually renting it at below market rates, which is, which is almost like a almost like a subsidy, but it's not really a subsidy. And it's helping the village or it's helping the city to actually get income to operate and the bottom line. And at the same time, it's helping citizens to actually financially manage through things. Not only that, you could redeploy the rapid housing. You could actually offer, like some of the stuff we go into more detail later in the report, affordable housing is a problem throughout the entire province. When we get down later and we're trying to attract new people to the community, redeploy some of this housing for affordable housing. You wanna talk about attracting people? Affordable housing is a problem everywhere. If you have some uh, affordable housing you can offer, you might be able to attract some young families up here that might not otherwise have uh, landed there. So median term recovery plans, some of this sounds like it's already happening, but develop 101 direct assistance programs to help businesses. They need a lot of help in a bunch of different ways. This will be a single point of contact for businesses when it comes to accessing recovery supports and programs. Sounds like your, your recovery managers are already on this, which is awesome. This can help them navigate awareness around a constantly changing recovery program landscape. They can work uh, in collaboration with other organizations to deliver entrepreneurship training, disaster planning assistance with recovery initiatives, business uh, financial planning assistance, language barrier support resources, all these sort of things. Also, don't forget about home-based businesses. Uh, you need to provide support for home-based businesses in addition to more traditional businesses. And so this is something where you might not realize this, but 50% of the businesses who participated in the economic recovery survey were actually home-based businesses. And over the past 10 years, BC has experienced unprecedented growth in home-based business sector, which is now estimated to account for upwards of 9% of the BC's workforce. So this is like, people have to change their mindset around home-based businesses. They think of like, you know, their grandma selling jam at a farmer's market. No, 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 you gotta think about engineers. Do you know that most construction companies count as home-based businesses because they don't have an office. They operate out of their home. There's all these other scientific and technical trades. Some of the highest paid income brackets that are out there can be home-based businesses. So there's a huge, and like this is everywhere. Canvas has 6,000 businesses, 3,000 of them are home-based. Nobody thinks about that. And so you, you uh, don't forget about these home-based business people. They are there and they're a very important part of your economy. Not only that, it's super attractive for new entrepreneurs, very low startup costs. It uh, also home-based businesses represent remote workers. There's huge opportunity there. Uh, remote workers also bring money into an economy and they can establish themselves sooner. So just some advantages there. Sounds like you're already kind of starting some of these processes, but move ahead with the development of an overall community recovery plan. And so the idea here is you could basically take an OCP or something to that effect, but you can build in other layers of things that have to happen. So one of the things that I would like to really suggest is that there should be a community emergency management plan that's developed. That's one of the biggest things that's gonna change. This is a brand new thing communities are doing. Most of them haven't even really started this you have an opportunity right now to get ahead of the game, like ahead of the ball and start doing some of this stuff. And you can coordinate again with Living First Nations and other stakeholders in the region and really have this active overall kind of plan. Create a goal of having most residents back in the community along with a functional downtown by the summer of 2024. So people mentally do better with goals. And the big thing here is that you have a huge number of, a huge amount of your economy before was based around tourism and agriculture, which is extremely seasonal. You have to be able to capitalize on summers. If you miss a summer, you are going to have a huge problem with your economy. This summer, I felt like might be a little too early to really be setting there as a goal. But next summer, you should really have something. You've got to draw a line in the sand. You got to start uh, making this like really happen for people so that they can start to get hope and they start moving back. And I think part of that is having a village office rebuilt. People really wanted that. They specifically were asking for that. You should have that in place. You should have your basic, all nine of your basic businesses back in place. You should have a functioning economy and be set up for that summer that's coming up. 
And this uh, major milestone will also somewhat coincide with the three-year mark for insurance, which might be another deadline for some other people. Uh, depends on what extensions kind of look like. And yeah, so it's a chance to kind of capitalize on the seasonality. Longer term stuff, start to talk about economic development initiatives. We give lots of examples of what that looks like. Entrepreneurship uh, support is a key thing. Beyond that, start to really look at attracting new businesses to town and then business retention and expansion support. Creating an active campaign to market and promote the region. You had a lot of tourism here. There's lots of opportunity here to do stuff like uh, develop a new unified brand for the whole region, develop new marketing materials, get it out there so that you're working with other organizations that are tourism-based organizations. You have a new sign on the highway, for example, you could create things like that to start really driving uh, a lot of what was kind of happening before, start marketing things. Integrate emergency response assets into the community. This is something we heard from a lot of people. You could do this again. You know, the sirens and muster stations, some of you kind of remember that stuff. It wasn't necessarily a bell, maybe it was a siren. These are just things that people said, it doesn't necessarily have to be that, but it could be other things like purchase firefighting equipment and infrastructure, structural support units, there's more and more communities are buying their own structural support units and things along those lines. Consider that sort of stuff, including water reservoirs, pumps and sprinklers. Create a program with sprinklers on rooftops is something that people have said. They've had a lot of success in Ontario with things along those lines. Not only that, when you're rebuilding the community, build strategic fire breaks and uh, assays of the lay of the land. You can, to some degree, control the spread of fire and you can have people that are experts that will come in and they will look at fire flows and you can actually build natural fire breaks and make your community more resilient while you're rebuilding everything. Here's something actually, this is an idea, honestly, just came to me in the middle of the night. I haven't seen this anywhere else. I think this is an awesome opportunity for you. Create a world-class permanent emergency response and evacuation center. I can tell you this stuff is not going away. I'm seeing it more and more frequently over and over again. So think about it. Your whole community has had a lived experience. You've gone through this. There's going to be other communities in BC that are going to get evacuated and they're going to need to go somewhere. I think about like Camp Hope, if you've ever heard of that. But, you know, if you took some of this like rapid housing stuff and you set it up in a permanent kind of camp with a centralized sort of kitchen or something to that degree, communities need to be relocated when they get evacuated. Can you imagine you have a center and you have your whole community built around your shared experience? Now you can now use this to help other communities going forward. Not only that, this can bring money into the economy. You can actually get some pretty good contracts uh, provincially when you look at and support all your businesses in your economy. Because if you get a thousand people landing in your community, they're going to be buying groceries. They're going to be going to the restaurant. They're going to be buying all sorts of other stuff. So this is something that might be really a neat idea that you might be able to do by repurposing some of the stuff you're going to do temporarily. And like I said, it's not going away. It's going to happen again in the region more and more frequently. So why not get out in front of it? Something else that I heard quite a bit, and it's something to consider, is try to find capital funding to improve the water infrastructure of the village and the region. And this is something I kind of mentioned this before. People talked about a gravity-fed water system. And the biggest thing I would really say is that... Um, it doesn't have to be potable. That's what people are kind of talking about. And a lot of people kind of liked the idea of setting something up that could just keep things greener and not be relied on kind of the well systems that are going there. And I think you're already possibly looking into things like this. And you probably already heard this before, but it is something that might be a really interesting idea to like continue to make sure it's not forgotten. So I'm just going to stop there because I can go on forever. And there's way more in the report than what is there. And you're not going to necessarily be able to do it all. It's not going to be a silver bullet, but I think there's some really good stuff there that you can really use. Your recovery managers can take and the village can take and other organizations can take going forward. And I really hope that some of this, like that you do implement some of this and organizations do, because I would really uh, like, I really would love to see for the community to kind of continue like this path and you're doing a great job, keep it up. But yeah, I just want to throw that out there and also acknowledgements. I really appreciate all of the input and all the time people took to speak with me and Jamie, and that includes village staff, uh, mayor and council, LFN, TNRD directors, community members. Uh, the TNRD actually provided us, uh, the film commission provided photos for the report, uh, which they've done for us in the past. They're always great that way. So thank you very much. I'm gonna stop there. Sorry, I probably took longer than I was supposed to. Sorry, Alba. And uh, I will, I'm very happy to answer questions though, if anybody has any questions. And so, yeah. 
Thank you, Colin. Lots of information there, but you've uh, put it together, you know, taken those 100 pages and put it together in a, in a great PowerPoint. I wonder if that PowerPoint could be available to be on our village website. Absolutely. Of course. Yeah, definitely. Great. Good. Uh, our council, are there any questions for Colin or comments? Ah, look at that. Oh, Councillor McCann. Yes, one. Uh, basically to acknowledge the, the work that you've done, Colin, thank you. And to realize the work that you've given us to do, thank you so much for <laughs> giving us all that to think about and just, just, we'll just use that as a checklist to get going there. But I really do appreciate some of the, the ideas and the thought that you have and, and where it's coming from and look forward to as a council trying to implement at least some of those recommendations going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Councillor Lightfoot. Um, I'll echo uh, Councillor McCann's comments and also add that um, good data is the best way to move forward. And I think you've provided good insight for a lot of our funding agencies. And just um, of note, um, on the 22nd, there was a, a prayer walk so um, the blessing of the village has started. I'm not sure if it was completed that day, but I, I personally wasn't able to attend, but I believe it was an excellent event and the beginning of a, a good, good future. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. And I, I just wanna also add Colin, uh, your comments at the very beginning when you said that, uh, you know, council doesn't need to undertake all of these things. There are other groups out there that could can um, support and help and uh, I appreciate that as well. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to contribute. And it's been a pleasure uh, getting to know all of you and I'll be following you along in the background uh, in the meantime, thanks again. Perfect, great, thank you, Colin. All right, we'll move on to, num uh, sorry, Councillor Lightfoot, do you have a question? I'm just wondering if we should move to receive um, Colin's report and ask that it be posted on our website. Um, Councillor Lightfoot, it will be posted on the website. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So item number eight, uh, we're going to move on to bylaws, policies and resolutions. And um, we're going to look at the um, financial plan bylaw. Uh, CFO Mombercat, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor O'Connor. I actually hadn't planned on making any other comments on this or doing a presentation because we have had a couple of presentations on it um, so far, and and really there's no uh, there's no new information here from the presentation that we did at the community meeting. I think was the last time we looked at it, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody had anything specific they wanted to know. Okay, thank you. So why don't we put this uh, motion ahead, if we could have a um, uh, councillor please make the, the motion for the first three readings. Councillor Lightfoot. I move that council give first three readings to the 2023-2027 financial plan bylaw number 732-2023. Great, and a seconder? I'll second. Thank you. Are there any are there any comments or questions for CFO Mombercat? No. Okay. Seeing seeing none. All those in favor? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Carried. All right. Then we'll move on to correspondence, and we have one item for information: um, a letter from uh, Lois Brooks. And I'm just before this comes forward, I just want to comment that we certainly appreciate the feedback on that correspondence uh, that we provided the, um, the residents and uh, they can look forward to hopefully another one coming out very soon. Um, who would like to make the motion? I'll make the motion. Thank you to, um, to receive this um, correspondence for information and a seconder. I'll second. Thank you, Councillor Michelle. All those in favor? Carried. Perfect. All right. 
We'll move on to verbal reports and um, I will begin. So as I mentioned earlier, it's been three weeks uh, since our last council meeting. Um, some of the highlights over the last few weeks, you know, of course, very, very busy. Um, but some of my highlights, um, I attended the school district 74 uh, facilities engagement meeting. And it was uh, wonderful to hear that the Kamshin field will be renovated to be a more uh, usable and safe uh, space for, for the kids there, of course, and community that uses the, the field. Yesterday morning, I met with Kathy Duell, Executive Director of Clinical Operations for Interior Health. And then I attended the community engagement meeting in the evening. It was good to see the ground being broken um, out by the uh, health building, the First, uh, First Nation Health Building, uh, for the work that's going, being done to prepare for the modular um, building for a doctor's, the doctor Stephanie to work out of. Um, Kathy reported that it should be ready uh, to be moved into by late summer. Um, as Councillor Lightfoot mentioned, um, I, uh, I was able to attend the prayer walk through the village where I, I was asked to welcome the participants. And, you know, we had uh, people there, you know, not only uh, various NGOs and faith-based groups that came as it was a non-denominational prayer walk, but you know, there were property owners there, our friends and neighbors from our, the surrounding areas. We had Lytton First Nation representatives there. Siska, Kanaka, Nikaman, people from all around. Um, and I apologize, apologize if I've missed anyone, but it was, uh, it was a, just a really lovely day. And thanks to, I believe it was Angus Muir was one of the key organizers for that. Uh, last week, I attended SILGA, the Southern Interior Local Government Association. I spent three days in Vernon where I attended you know, various workshops and had the opportunity to network and engage in discussions with other mayors, um, politicians, and other partners that were there. An excellent three days. This morning, uh, before coming into Kamloops, I drove through the village. Um, I did notice that they've got quite a number of hydro poles up on Fraser Street, which was great to see. I know that there is a concern from property owners and uh, people around that the work in the village has been stopped. And the word I think that's been put out is that it's because money has, um, has run out. And as uh, Mike Glasschuk mentioned in his report, that is not the case. Um, the, uh, the work is going to be continuing. We're kind of moving on to a different phase, um, but uh, you know, we shouldn't be seeing seeing the village look like it is right now with not a lot of work happening for very long. So we will get that going. Um, yeah, I think that's it for my report for uh, for these last three weeks. As I said, just lots, just very busy with various meetings and emails and all sorts of things as usual. So I'll move on to Councillor Toss. Thank you, Mayor O'Connor. Um, I'm here in Tawasson on the traditional territories of Tawasson First Nation and Musqueam peoples. Um, I too attended the prayer walk on Saturday, April 22nd. Um, it was very impactful to have people in the village. I think it was the first not recovery driven, like nuts and bolts driven activity in the village with residents. So. It um, it got me it got me there. <laughs> My eyes sweat a bit having everyone together like that. I think it was. Um, I'm looking forward to those fences coming down. As I've said, on the 24th, um, that was I think the Monday and in the morning we had a construction meeting with Patrick Michelle and um, the working group, which um, is so exciting. I'm so excited about uh, May 19th and 20th. Um, then that afternoon, we met with our recovery managers for the first time, and I can't say enough about how excited I am to have uh, Mike Blaschak and Don Wong on board, and um, they're so dynamic and um, knowledgeable and connected, and I think residents should know that we have a lot to look forward to having them on board, and um, working with Diane mumberkett has been great as well with our the um, temporary CAO in that position has been 
um, really positive. And then off to the SILGA conference with Mayor O'Connor and Councillor McCann. Um, there was councils and, and mayors from and CAOs and MLAs from Revelstoke to Lillooet. Um, there was uh, Dan Ashton, Harwinder Santu, Raleigh Russell, uh, Municipal Affairs and Kang was there. Um, I went and plugged the construction symposium to um, Anne Kang, and, and it, it sounds like there'll be some attendance from some MLAs, so that was exciting. Um, Trisha Thorpe, TNRD director, was also at that um, conference, which was great. Um, so th the conference sort of brings together resolutions from the Southern Interior local governments and brings them to the, um, the Union of BC Municipalities, and those motions go forward to the province. So it could be anything from specific upgrades to portions of the highway to subsidies, asking for more subsidies for rural areas for transit. Um, we had the opportunity, um, which was great, to tour the sewer treatment plant in Vernon. So we learned a lot about um, their processes, of course, on an enormous scale. Um, so it was very, very informative. I'm really, really glad I attended. Back on um, Saturday the 29th, to, meet with the recovery managers in person. So we had a full day of learning um, what, uh, well, it was more sharing of information and um, some planning and looking at some bigger goals. And it, it was it was really um, empowering and I'm excited, like I say. And then um, unfortunately I missed a construction workshop, the construction symposium workshop this morning, um, but that, um, because I had to work teaching and although I was really disappointed, I am excited that I have taken a personal leave for next year. So I intend to focus more on council and I'll be in Lytton a lot more and hopefully won't be missing some of these events like the interior health um, meeting there the other day. So I think that's about it for me. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Councillor Toss. Councillor McCann. Thank you, Mayor O'Connor. Um, I'm going to rattle through quite a bit, but first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, Chief Nakaya Hanna and the newly elected Lytton First Nation Council, and I look forward to working with them all. Um, I have a number of things that I've been involved in lately, and um, the, the high point is probably working with uh, Patrick and Councillor Toss and a number of other people representing the working group for the building symposium and our our, uh, our building director, Ron Dickinson has been really helpful with that as well. So I'm pretty excited about having that event here in Lytton and having people come and actually come to our community and, and spend some time with us and working on this really important project. Uh, I've been involved in Fire Smart, uh, attending their meetings, um, working with uh, procedures by law. I found that really interesting, even though I have no clue what we're talking about half the time, I'm starting to figure that out. The prayer walk was an awesome experience as was the uh, community um, coffee meeting that happened uh, just a few days before that. Uh, two opportunities for people to get together. And I think it, all of those things make a big difference for those of us in Lytton and those that are, that are finding ways to come home and, and visit with us. Um, I, I had an interview with a master's student doing some research about um, fire resiliency and, and how local government works. That was kind of interesting. Uh, the SILGA Conference of Southern Interior Local Government Association highlights for me were, uh, were really and truly was doing the wastewater treatment facility. Like I had expected something different but um, to me, being able to recycle wastewater is just a really smart thing to do if you can find ways to do that. And we didn't get to see the full details on that, but we sure got a really good tour. Um, the workshops I attended, I found to be uh, really helpful. They were, um, were regarding municipal government roles, responsibilities, and opportunities. I met with many elected officials from across our region and heard discussions regarding issues relevant to many and, and housing in particular is something that we are all addressing. And maybe our context is a little different, but nonetheless, we're still all looking at housing and homelessness in, in our own particular ways in our municipalities. 
um, I got involved, uh, included in the Chief Spintland Park Committee. And I'd like to just let people know that, um, I don't know for how many years, but this has been a long time coming. There's been people like John Hogan and Peggy Chutes working and, and Chief Janet working in the background for a very long time to make the Chief Spintland Park a reality down by the parish hall and in that area. And they've been working with the new Pathways to Gold people and have access funding and are now at the point where they need to get that funding uh, spent on putting together the, the landscaping for that project. And so it's been really an excellent opportunity for me to be included with the, the people in that group and to uh, actually be meeting together in Lytton at the parish hall on Monday to, to find out how we can move that forward in a, in a good way. Um, uh, April was just uh, many, many meetings and guess what? May started the same. Holy cow, hey? Um, I, oh, yes, I attended the, uh, the health planning. I found that to be interesting session. So just like to remind people that the, the health uh, planning session for the Lytton Health Facility is having, they're having another meeting. So if you missed the one last night, there is still another one on the 15th from 4 until 7. And just a little heads up from what we found last night was that it, it, you don't sit and listen to somebody talk for those three hours. There's a brief presentation and then the rest of the time is up to you how long you want to stay and engage, but you are welcome to engage in a variety of topics and provide information and ask questions uh, for the rest of the time. So just somebody asked me if you had to sit there for three hours. No, no, you don't. Um, and I am hoping that there might be volunteers willing to assist with the building symposium later this month. Please get a hold of Patrick um, if you can do that and, and arrange that with him. Uh, upcoming community events tomorrow is the LFN inauguration. The interior health planning session number two is on the 15th. The building symposium itself is on the 19th and 20th. Uh, May long weekend, we have events happening in the community, probably primarily up at uh, Stein Valley School and in the Battlefield area and at the hall up there. And uh, David Choi from AG Foods has reached out and has is planning a uh, community dinner at the end of the month at the Alapan Community Hall as well. And that's something open to all residents. And he's asking that uh, we connect with people who have had to move away and, and encourage them to come and join us at that event. So I'll end my presentation there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McCann. Councillor Lightfoot. Sorry, Councillor Michelle's next. I apologize, <laughs> Councillor Michelle. <laughs> um, so I'm not gonna go over all the same stuff. I didn't go to Silga, but the other meetings, the community meeting, all of that, I attended. Um, the main thing I want to reiterate Councillor Toss's um, enthusiasm regarding Mike and Dawn, our new recovery managers. We met on Saturday and had a planning session and I came away from that finally feeling like there's actually a little bit of light at the end of this tunnel and it's it's looking a little hopeful now. So that was the main thing over the last three weeks, aside from all the, the meetings and emails and the usual, the usual stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Michelle. Now, Councillor Lightfoot. Ah, uh, the beauty of going last. Um, so I, I attended, uh, as Melissa said, I, I attended uh, a lot of the sa same meetings, uh, the school meeting. Um, we had several um, workshops talking about bylaws. I really enjoyed the community um, coffee that uh, United Way in the village and Kumshin Raft put together. And I first met the recovery managers at that event on the 20th. And um, just to echo um, Melissa's comments that I am feeling quite hopeful that we have um, two really strongly driven um, leaders in um, finding, finding where the impediments are and um, helping us develop strategies to overcome them. Aside from um, that, 
the Fire Smart um, meeting that Noni and I attend, I haven't attended them all, but I, um, I do know that one of their efforts was that on the 26th, yard waste would be collected from Ponderosa and Loring Way. And I'm not sure how that um, event transpired. I did see uh, Roy, who was the gentleman that picked it up and he said that he got some response. So um, that was good to minimize fuel, um, fuel risk. The other thing that we talked about at FireSmart and I'm not sure if it has come about yet, is um, a pair of, of people coming around to each household in Ponderosa and Loring Way doing an, a home assessment. And so when we get more details on that, um, everyone in those areas will have the uh, opportunity to have them evaluate their yard and maybe give them some suggestions on where to minimize risks. Um, the only other thing that I did different from the, um, the rest of the council was I recently was put on the uh, NDIT board of directors. Um, NDIT for most people I think know it's Northern Development Initiative Trust and it was formed when um, the BCR railway was, was sold and those monies were given to promote economic development. And our community has benefited from that. We are the most Southern um, community um, in the NDIT. It goes to Bella Coola and all the way up to the Yukon. So we had our AGM in Prince George on the 27th. And I went up there and intend, uh, attended that. They have um, a strategy where they keep the majority of their monies in investments and they only give out uh, the interest each year and it's millions of dollars, but they've managed it well. However, um, recent economic challenges, um, their revenues are a bit lower than they have been historically. And so their grant funding may not be able to um, go for the four rounds in the future. And we may only have three rounds where people can apply for their various grants. But it was interesting. What I did hear from everyone up there, though, was how incredibly dry it is everywhere. And uh, the day I got after I got home, I was surprised at the number of fires that had uh, been started um, in that area, 70 mile Prince George area. And then, of course, we all know that Cash Creek has once again suffered the ravages of um, too much water. So talking with the project managers gave me a lot of hope that we can move ahead and, and recover. But um, the night after we had our meeting with them, I actually had to note in addition um, the concern of um, fire response, emergency, emergency response, um, those are constantly with us all the time. I know that Colin brought it up in his report tonight. And so if there's anyone out there that's at all interested in being part of our fire department or that wants to um, assist in emergency, um, please let us know because there's always a need for those type of people. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Lightfoot. Okay, so that brings us now to the um, end of the open meeting. We're going to be now moving into closed meeting. And so we would like uh, a motion made here. Um, who would like to move? I'll move council, close the meeting to the public and uh, to discuss matters wow. related to Move to a closed session, sorry. <laughs> yes, thank you. A seconder? Seconded toss. Oh, thank you, all those in favor. Great, thank you and carried. So thank you to everyone who attended tonight's meeting. Um, and I'm going to turn it back over to CEO Bandman. Thank you very much, Mayor Connor. That concludes our public portion of our meeting. Thank you for attending to the public and staff. We just ask that you remove yourselves from the meeting as we go into closed session. And thank you very much.